Thanks, everyone. Moving on to the next session of this block. And in this session, we are going to hear about deep linking machine learning to connect up the PIDs from a dream team uh, working on Meta at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So it's my pleasure to introduce in no particular order, just the order that I grabbed from Sketch, Alex Wade, Ana Maria Istrate, Dong Wei Li, and Jennifer Lin. So I will leave it over to you to tell everyone about deep linking machine learning to connect up the PIDs. Hi, good afternoon, morning, um, evening. Can everyone hear me? All yeah. right, let's get going. So a quick overview of um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is where our team comes from. Alex, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. All right, so the mission of CZI Science is to support uh, science and technology to cure, prevent, and manage all diseases by the end of the century. Our more immediate goal <laughs> before we get there is to accelerate biomedical science with open collaborative models of research. Next slide, please. And the way in which we do this is to both fund efforts, build internally, engage with the community and collaborate with partners in the community. Um, the place that we sit at is the building. Um, so next slide, please. Just a quick advance. Um, this is a portfolio of um, other products, technology products and tools that our colleagues within CCI Science are working on. The group that we come from is from Meta. So next slide, please. Meta is a tool to support biomedical researchers to understand and explore science as it involves. So the use cases are to stay up to speed with science and also uh, um, to be able to discover um, the facts that come out of science and enable this discovery not only through journal articles and preprints, but also data, software, methods and protocols, conference papers, clinical trials, and other resources as we'll address today. Next slide, please. Um, that is the end product per se, but our larger goal is to create a living and connected navigable map of biomedical knowledge in order to be able to, through this tool, um, enable set discovery. Next slide, please. The question that we always ask ourselves is why machine learning? The question is not why not machine learning? Obviously, it's it's um, the buzz, right? Um, but, you know, it's a tool. And as all tools are, they're useful for the purpose that they serve. Would you use a hammer to drink soup at dinner? Um, so machine learning is not a solution for every type of problem. There are certainly cases where robust solutions can be developed without <laughs> Um, but it's useful when, say, we cannot code the rules, um, when a deterministic solution doesn't work because it's too complicated, too many factors involved, overlapping rules, you need continual tuning of these rules. Um, also, it's useful when it is not practical or feasible to apply manual labor to the problem. Um, this is a simple scaling issue. So next slide, please. Um, we apply machine learning to a number of different areas within Meta. Many, some of these are identified here, um, and you know, author disambiguation, affiliation disambiguation. These are things that we commonly think about and talk about, especially within this community. Today, in this um, session together, we're going to dive into the last three: identifying links from papers to data to other research resources, and that is buried in the full text of a paper identifying concepts and topics um, in the literature, and also recommending related entities. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the first, first area that we use machine learning. Yes, um, hi everyone, my name is Anna Maria and I will be talking about some of the machine learning work that we've been doing to extract mentions of different types of resources from full text. So uh, <clears throat> one of Meta's value propositions is the amount of uh, full text paper we ingest uh, directly from publishers. 
and that allows us to do data mining for uh, entities such as data sets, RIDs, uh, methods, genes, drugs, diseases. Um, and for the purpose of today, I'll focus on the first two uh, data sets and RIDs and the way in which we are able to link them to uh, papers in our knowledge graph. Next slide, please. Awesome. So um, there are two main uh, ways in which we are uh, linking resources such as data sets and RIDs uh, and other types of identifiers to papers in our knowledge graph. The first approach is mining directly for these resources from the literature. And as I mentioned, we have a corpus of full text papers and we have some machine learning models that we have built and that are able to extract mentions of data sets and RIDs directly from these papers. And for data sets right now, we are focusing only on accession number IDs. Um, and we are targeting repositories such as Geo, Bioproject, GenBank, Pride, and so on. And this is just a limited set. Um, for on the sec you know, for uh, the right side of the slide, you can see the other way in which we are uh, linking resources to papers in our knowledge graph. We are ingesting uh, resources outputs from different outside sources such as data sites, Zenodo, Dryad. Uh, the Broad Institute, Mendeley Data, Human Brain Project. And again, this is just a small subset of uh, all the sources we ingest, and it's not by any means an exhaustive list. Next slide, please. So in terms of the machine learning work that we are doing, it, it particularly to uh, mine for mentions of data sets, I'm going to describe a little bit the workflow we have been going through. So in this uh, particular, uh, on this particular task, we have started with uh, data set annotations that we took from EuroPMC and that were further bio curated by our domain uh, expert team that we have in house. We have linked these to the full text paper we uh, have uh, ingested directly from publishers and we have created our training data. We have then built a bird-based machine learning model that is a named entity recognition model and that is able to recognize mentions of accession numbers for data sets from full text papers. We're evaluating this model with uh, metrics such as precision and recall, uh, and also with uh, qualitatively, again, with our in-house uh, bio curation team. We are then able to apply this model to new full text content uh, on papers that the model hasn't seen before. And one thing to, main, to mention here is that uh, the papers that we have full text, uh, full text uh, for, depending on where we, uh, we get them from, they may come with an identifier such as a DOI, a PMID, or a PMCID. And this is something we, we are able to handle internally and still link all of, all of these papers in our knowledge graph and apply our models on them. Next slide, please. So uh, here uh, we can see two examples. On the left, we can see a paper that was published in a research journal uh, the title of the paper is Progressive Cross-Stream Cooperation in Spatial and Temporal Domain for Action Localization. Uh, we can see an example of a data set that our machine learning model was able to extract from this paper. Uh, this particular data set is an entry in the BioProject repository uh, and is pointing to a genome sequence. We're, we are also able to extract an RID point, pointing to a software uh, for the Burroughs Wheeler Aligner. Uh, on the right, we can see an example of a preprint that has been published on the Med Archive preprint server, and that is tackling coronavirus, which, as we all know, it's a very timely uh, topic of interest right now. Uh, and again, our machine learning model was able to extract the associated data set, which in this case, it's a GenBank entry uh, for a complete genome uh, that that's entitled Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus to Isolate, that it seems it's coming from Wuhan. Uh, so our machine learning models are able to extract these mentions uh, both uh, from papers uh, that uh, are published in journals or, uh, fr fr or from preprints, such as BioArchive and MedArchive. Next slide, please. And as I've mentioned, we are also ingesting and linking resources from outside sources. And in the, on this slide, we can see just a very small number of examples of uh, data sets and software uh, we have ingested from different repositories, such as Nojo, Dryad, uh, Mendeley Data. 
And uh, one important thing to note here is that we are actually linking these resources to papers in our knowledge graph, and we are making these available to users in the meta application, where uh, you can see the associated resources such as data sets and software with a paper, and vice versa. Users can see the associated papers with a data set or a software uh, ingested. Um, that's on me, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Don Kui. Yeah, next one, please. Uh, another type of uh, PID we use is the concept unique identifier from the UMLS ontology. So in order to build a connected map of science, we want to go deep into the biomedical concepts that have been mentioned in the papers. So we developed the algorithm, what we call the concept recognition engine to recognize and link genes, drugs, disease, including like mesh terms and other concepts to the UMLS ontology. So each term in the ontology is identified through a unique identifier called CUI or concept unique identifier. It's also linked to the international resource identifier or IRI. Um, next one, please. To develop what we call this uh, concept recognition engine, uh, we first uh, created a human labeled data set called MedMentions, and we then train a ML model um, we then apply this to process new papers ingested into our knowledge graph on a daily basis. Um, as many of you know, uh, like the PubMed, they assign mesh terms to papers. This process is a manual process due to the huge number of publications. So it often takes uh, uh, several weeks or months to do this assignment. So with the CRE, we're able to do this in almost like real time on a daily basis. So Average about four weeks earlier, we're able to assign mesh terms to new papers. Um, next one, please. Yeah. Here, I want to basically illustrate how we use the unique concept identifiers uh, to for uh, information retrieval uh, in Meta. So one is what we call a type of head. So as you know, many concepts, they have different names. For example, leprosy is also known as Hansen's disease. So in this case, when the user starts to type in Hansen's, we're able to identify through a synonym lookup and map to the unique concept name, we call a canonical name, and also the underlining uh, identifier. Uh, we then use, so it's kind of a, the lower left picture, we then use the structure of the ontology to return additional uh, documents. We call this a query expansion. Um, Alex, I'm handing over this to you. Great, now I realize the error of my ways, which is I have to pivot back and forth between this window and the other window when I'm, when I'm presenting. Thank you, Dong Hui. Um, and just building off of what Dong Hui was mentioning, um, uh, we use a, a large number of the UMLS ontologies to start to identify these, these biomedical entities in the papers. But one of the directions that we're now going is uh, to start looking at the relationships that uh, exist between the entities in the paper, that, that this gene data three is a biomarker for Barakat syndrome. So the boxes there represent the entities and the, and the future work that we're starting into right now is on the relationships side. Uh, and hopefully in a way that this starts to, to complement some of the work uh, that Melissa talked about during her plenary earlier today with the, with the Mondo ontologies. And specifically in this space, we have been uh, partnering with our, our research partners at UMass Amherst. Uh, they recently built a proof of concept discovery engine on top of the CORD-19 data set, uh, which does both of these things together. So on the left-hand side of the screenshot here, you can see the hit highlighting or entity highlighting of the genes, drugs, and diseases that they have mined out of this data set. But over on the, the, uh, the right side, sorry, the, uh, on the right side there, you see the set of relationships between, uh, for example, here are the genes and diseases that exist. Now, in this case, these aren't being mined from the literature. They're, they're being linked into this from the DisGenNet uh, database. And, and our goal is to use both of these things in tandem. So use authoritative files where we can link them up via PIDs, but then also be able to harvest new relationships where they're mentioned in the literature. And then lastly, the, the use of uh, uh, machine learning within the meta application is really around a, a recommendation engine. And this surfaces itself a number of different places in the tool. We want to be able to surface new entities such as papers and people and concepts 
um, in, in different scenarios. So I'm going to give a, a three different examples here, one related to a, a feed, one related to how they get surfaced in, in search to help the users winnow down a set of search results, and then finally making paper recommendations. So Jennifer uh, gave a brief uh, description of the meta application uh, at the opening here, uh, but just to sort of walk you through the structure of the, of the page here, over in the purple section, uh, very similar to a Slack environment, uh, but instead of Slack channels, uh, I have a number of feeds here that I have either uh, created on my own or I subscribe to within the within the application. And instead of having Slack conversations in the middle, what you're getting is a, is a constantly updated feed of new papers that are coming in as they're getting published. I draw your attention all the way over to, to the red box uh, on the sidebar here, and this is where we start surfacing recommendations. And so these recommendations can be people, they can be journals, they can be concepts, uh, but the intent here is to supplement the set of papers that I'm looking at with, within my feed with some related entities uh, that I might want to pivot away to learn more about, I might want to follow in a new feed, uh, or I might want to, to search on the item. So in this situation here, if I click on the little search icon on the pop-up window, uh, this will actually take me over to the, uh, the search results page. So now I'm getting a set of, of papers here for S protein severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, there's a lot of papers in this set of search results. I can sort it by uh, paper impact or I can sort it by recency. Uh, but you can also see a, a a further set of recommendations up here that are recommendations to help the user filter down their set of search results. Again, I can filter by uh, by by people, by uh, by journals. I'm going to select here one of the oops, one of the concepts. Um, I can get a little bit more information about this concept. I can see uh, how many new papers per day are coming in, uh, how many researchers have published papers that, that contain this concept. Um, and if I click on that item, that will add that term or that concept to my search and it will filter down the set of search results. And then finally, uh, paper recommendations. So uh, looking at a, an individual paper here, um, I can then see some related papers to this. And we do this in a, in a, in a, a compound way. We look at the overall citation graph, papers that this paper has cited or papers that are cited in this paper. Uh, we look at co-authorship similarity. So we look at the, the authorship of this paper and see other papers that have been, been authored by a subset of these authors. And then we also look at semantic similarity. So you can see the concepts that we have mined from this particular paper up at the top. Um, and we look um, specifically at a subset of the OMLS ontologies, uh, mostly weighted to the, to, to the MeSH subject heading. And so papers that have the closest similarity of a citation graph, a co-authorship graph, um, and or a semantic similarity are the ones that we rank in this related papers. And this is a set of related papers for this one paper. We can also do this in aggregate. So I have here a, a library, a, a set of saved items within the application. Um, this, in this particular one, it's not based around a particular project or particular subject area. It's just things that I have added that I want to read. And this related papers will effectively do the same thing that they did in the last example, uh, but they'll do it for an entire collection and recommend some new papers there. And as a, uh, as a philanthropic organization, um, as one that is also uh, really heavily involved in uh, looking at how we can apply machine learning to solve some of these problems. Uh, we are also uh, trying to make as much of this uh, available to the research community as we can. And so a few of the resources that we've mentioned here today um, are the, the CORD19 data set, which was a collaborative project along with Allen AI and Google and uh, National Library of Medicine. Um, that data set is, is being updated regularly. It's been a, a daily updated data set. We're gonna pivot over to a weekly updated data set. Um, we've also uh, uh, published a blog post here on the partnership with UMass Amherst and a number of other assets, both models and training data sets that they have released. Uh, I showed the screenshot of the KD COVID that showed that relationship uh, work. Uh, that is all open source and available on GitHub. Uh, Don Hui talked about the training set that was used to train the concept recognition engine. Uh, the med mentions data is out on GitHub. Uh, there's also a preprint on archive.org for that. 
Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the work that Anna talked about, about the full text mining, uh, that data is all available out on GitHub as well. And with that, I think we are open to take uh, any questions unless there was anything that you wanted to, uh, to add in, Jennifer. Yes, please, questions. Also, this was meant um, to be a discussion amongst all the participants. We would love to hear about how you're applying machine learning and your tooling, the challenges that you've faced. Um, so yeah, please, please weigh in, whether it's in the chat window or we can figure out how to get you on stage. Yeah, Jennifer, just to pop in and say there are some good questions in the question box. If you pull if you pull that up and want to talk about any of those responses or encourage those who posted the questions to come on up and talk. Yes, um, I there was a really great question. Let's see, we've been answering them along the way. Um, one of the questions is about how to access this data. So this is to extend Alex's um, no, uh, slide with the list of resources and the links to what is available. Um, on top of that, we are in the works of making all of the data in the knowledge graph, in this research graph, publicly available, licensed for reuse, CC0. Um, and the, the development is underway, but as with all of you who know who have built APIs, uh, it, it's best done in partnership with the user community. Um, so we would love for you to reach out and let us know if you're interested in some of this data so that your use cases can be incorporated into our development path. Um, the timeline for rolling this API out um, will be in you know, the first half of this year. So please get in touch. Another question from Mark Watts, is the meta dashboard personal or does it favor group accounts? I think that the question is asking um, is connected to how your account within meta.org is connected up to the results that you see in the feeds. Um, so the way that the feeds work um, in meta is that you create them and they are associated to your account. There is sharing of feeds that you construct, um, but though it, there we haven't yet um, had the chance to expand on the collaboration functionality. Currently, if you share your own personal feed to someone else, basically it creates that same feed for them. But um, there's a lot of opportunity on the collaboration end. Um, so thank you for this feedback. It, it makes Maybe sense. Also, Anna, you could also uh, talk briefly about the, the personalization feature and personalized ranking within a feed. Put you on the spot. Yes. Yeah, um, just very briefly, if you are using Meta and you are a fairly engaged user, uh, you will get uh, the opportunity to have a personalized ranking. So you can always switch back and forth if you want to. But uh, it will uh, also it will also give you the option to uh, have this uh, sort of like personalization. And it's basically uh, the model behind it. It's a machine learning model that's using um, the papers that you have interacted with previously. Uh, and uh, it's tailoring uh, and ranking the papers in your feed to be as similar as possible to what you have already interacted with. I was about to write a more serious response to the question about how much time is taken up to deal with dirty source data. But um, let me just uh, open this up to the panel to be able to respond. I'll start off, um, obviously 250% is not <laughs> a serious answer, but it is a lot because data comes in across many different sources. And um, the data per se, let's just be more specific. Let's say it's metadata for a uh, preprint in bioarchive or a nature article. Um, the, we, do, we actually have that metadata, collect that metadata from multiple sources. Um, so we pull from PubMed um, and we also pull from the registration agencies. And it's not only that the data from these individual places um, might be inconsistent, but across the same works, right, there might be inconsistent, 
inconsistencies. So there's quite a lot of um, analysis that we have to do and processing that we have to do in order to deliver um, the, the view of the metadata record um, that best suits the use case. Others on the panel, if you'd like to chime in. I would say it's, it's something it's very hard to quantify. Definitely as with any data sources, they all have a great value, but also we do we do realize and uh, we can't just take the data as granted for, for granted. And uh, there's always a cleaning step. And often in our work workflow is whenever we have the similar or the same data from multiple sources and we do have a, a step insert, really try to do like some sort of a disambiguation and also try to merge and compare the data. I would say it is, uh, it is just an integral part of our work. Anytime you work with data, uh, yeah, I feel like just inevitable we have to deal with this kind of situation. Especially just as a last point, I know we're over time, but with respect to machine learning, right, um, as uh, as the model continues to run over time, you have concept drift, right? And so being able to have a goal reference data set by which to measure the performance of the models and the outputs is really, really important. So that, I, I would say that's a tool, <laughs> but it's not, it is not a special tool by any means. This is common practice. Great. So I think maybe we should wrap up at this point and head on over to Slack to continue the discussion. Let's give this meta team a more round of applause. Thank you so much for being here, talking about all this amazing work that you're doing. Super, super cool. And thanks to everybody for chiming in on the discussion and asking questions. So with that, we will conclude this portion of the block and begin to transition to the next session, which is a party time or a break time or whatever you want it to be time. <laughs>